One moment, sorry. Is this got a thing? Yeah. So this is to adjust my seat or with my clerks. It says this. Bounce off it. Ah, I think it will be done. It is somebody very tall must have been sitting here last. I'm sorry, yes. Uh, have we had it called on or? You have, sorry, I didn't notice. Um, yes, Miss Yang. My lords, um, I appear for the appellant Prudential Assurance Company Limited, and my learned friend, Mr. Mantle, appears for the respondent commissioners. Um, could I just check that your lordships should have three bundles in front of you um, a core bundle, a supplementary bundle, and an authorities bundle? We do. Thank you. So this is Prudential's appeal from a decision of the Upper Tribunal, um, and it concerns whether VAT, value added tax, should be charged to a supplier called Silverfleet on services provided when Silverfleet and the recipient of those supplies, Prudential, the appellant, were members of the same VAT group. And we say it shouldn't. The first year tribunal agreed, but the Upper Tribunal then overturned um, the first year tribunal's decision and found that VAT was chargeable because the services were in part invoiced and paid for after Silverfleet had left the VAT group. Yes, Ms. Yang, we, we have, of course, um, read it quite carefully and indeed the, the facts. Um, you've really said all that needs to be said already. Um, we saw it slightly to our surprise that, um, although it apparently took day, two days in the upper tribunal, it's got another two days here. Um, we may be turn out to be surprised, but we don't think this really needs to be a two-day case. We wouldn't be surprised if it finished today, and even if it didn't finish today, I don't think it'll go the whole of tomorrow. No, my, my lord, um, right. So uh, you can take it, we've read it and given it some thought, so um, you can be relatively focused in your introductory remarks. Thank you, my lord. Um, so we say this appeal is about how you construe section 43, subsection 1 of the VAT Act. Um, in light of the fact that it's the UK's implementation of Article 11 of the Principal VAT Directive. And that directs member states, when they implement um, a VAT grouping regime, to treat the members of that group as a single taxable person. Um, and it's about whether when you have a transaction, a real-life transaction between one member of a VAT group and another member, that gives rise to any VAT consequence. Um, we say not, three principal reasons, because you disregard the transaction, that's what section 43 sub 1 sub a tells you, um, also because you recognise that Silverfleet is not a taxable person, and also because you recognise where you treat the business of Silverfleet as carried on by the representative member in Prudential. You say you do that because it is required by section 43 sub 1, and it is necessary to give effect to the legislative purpose of treating Silverfleet and Prudential as a single taxable person whilst they're members of the same VAT group. The commissioners, in contrast, they invite you to lift that transaction out of the VAT group to allow it to have VAT consequences as if it were a transaction between non-grouped independent taxable persons. Um, in this way, the commissioners say that the time of supply rule regulation 90 is engaged and that gives rise to a VAT liability of Silverfleet. Um, we say that's wrong because the starting point of that analysis is to not regard, not recognise the reality that when these transactions actually took place, the investment management services were provided, Silverfleet and Prudential were to be treated as a single taxable person because they were VAT grouped. Uh, we say that's the Commissioner's case is against the purpose of reading of the legislation against the body of case law, which is both European and domestic. Um, the facts, I won't take your lordships through them, um, they're pretty simple and were summed up, but um, they are in the first year tribunal's judgment of paragraphs 4 to 12. Um, essentially, Silverfleet provided a certain... Well, I, I said we do know the facts. Yep. Great, my lord. Um, then I'll move on to the legislation. If we could start, please, in tab four of the authority. Um, and 
look at, so on page 29, starting at the bottom, is Article 2 of the Principle of Act Directive. Paragraph 1 begins, the following transaction shall be subject to VAT. If you turn over the page, um, what will we see? The supply of services for consideration within the territory of the member state by a taxable person acting as such. And that provision is implemented in the domestic legislation um, in section 1 of the VAT Act. Um, my lords, I'm afraid I'll be flipping for a while between tabs one and four, just so I can show you. Is that you. necessary? Um, nobody's suggesting that any real light is thrown on the meaning of the domestic statute by the directive, or is it, are they? Uh, certainly when it comes to how you construe section 43 in the domestic legislation. I see, all right. Uh, well, obviously I haven't taken that in properly. Very well. Right. So if we flip to uh, tab one, page three, section one, Sub 1, Sub A of the VAT Act, um, value added tax shall be charged in accordance with the provisions of this Act on the supply of goods or services in the United Kingdom, including anything treated as a supply. And then over the page, Section 4 of the VAT Act, um, scope of VAT on taxable supplies. Uh, subsection 1, VAT shall be charged on any supply of goods or services made in the United Kingdom where it is a taxable supply made by a taxable person in the course or furtherance of any business carried on by him, or by the taxable person making the supply. Um, definition of taxable person then takes, if I could take you to the principal VAT directive first, and um, tab four again, page 31, uh, article nine, paragraph one, taxable person shall mean any person who independently carries out in any place any economic activity whatever the purpose or result of that activity. Um, that's implemented in domestic legislation uh, in Section 3 of the VAT Act. Um, you don't have that, um, my lords, in your bundle, so if I could hand up three copies. All the legislation you have before you are the versions in force at the time Silverfleet left the VAT Group. Thank you. So section 3. We're doing this another time. Could you hold punch it? My apologies. Um, section 1. A person is a taxable person for the purposes of this Act, while he is or is required to be registered under this Act. So that's the domestic definition of taxable person. Section 2, uh, then we have um, what is meant by a supply of services. Um, that is in Article 24 for the purpose of the principle of that directive, which is tab 4, page 32. Uh, paragraph 1, supply of services shall mean any transaction which does not constitute a supply of goods. And then Article 25, a supply of services may consist in Arabia in one of the following transactions. May the assignment of intangible property, whether or not subject to the document establishing title. I don't need to read it out. It's C you want, isn't it? Uh, all the performance clauses, indeed, my lord. Um, but the point is, a supply is a transaction, which we say is a real world event. And you see that reflected in the UK legislation, um, section 5 of the VAT Act, which is tab 1, page 5. So sorry, page five, yeah. Meaning of supply. Um, subsection one, schedule four, shall apply for determining what is to be treated as supply of goods or services. Um, subsection two, subject to any provisions made by that schedule and to the Treasury orders under subsection three to six below. A supply in this act shall include all forms of supply, but not anything done, otherwise then for a consideration. And B, anything that is not a supply of goods, but done for a consideration, 
including if so done, the granting, assignment or surrender of any right is a supply. So a supply is something that is done, it's some event that has happened in real life. And then the next part um, is Article 11, which sets out the VAT grouping regime, tab 4, par uh, page 31, into Article 11 of the Principal VAT Regime. Page 31. After consulting the Advisory Committee on Value Added Tax, thereafter the VAT Committee, each member state may regard as a single taxable person any persons established in the territory of that member state who, while legally independent, are closely bound to one another by financial, economic and organisational links. There's no doubt in this case that um, Silverfleet and, and Prudential at the relevant time uh, were closely bound in a relevant way. Um, but as Article 11 says, one uh, regards as a single taxable person um, those who are that grouped. And then a member state exercising the option provided for in the first paragraph uh, may adopt any measure needed to prevent tax evasion or avoidance through the use of written provision. And there's no suggestion in this case that there is any tax avoidance obligation. So Article 11 um, gives the member state a choice whether to implement a VAT grouping regime. Um, the UK has chosen to do so. Um, and the domestic legislation is section 43 which is tab 1, page 10. <clears throat> Subsection 1, where under sections 43A, 43D, any bodies corporate are treated as members of this group, any business carried on by a member of the group shall be treated as carried on by the representative member, and A, any supply of goods or services by a member of the group to another member of the group shall be disregarded. And B, any supply which is a supply to which paragraph A above does not apply, and is a supply of goods or services by or to a member of the group, shall be treated as a supply by or to the representative member. And we don't need to read any further. A and B are really simply spelling out the consequences of the general point made in the introductory words. Uh, a and B spell out um, the consequences. It's as if it read, and therefore. Uh, and, and, and therefore, indeed, because yeah. if one is treated, if one is treating members as a single taxable person, then of course internal transactions right. have no VAT consequence, are disregarded, um, and transactions with third parties are treated as being made uh, to or by the representative member um, as a single taxable person. And then if I could take you to um, Article 193 of the Principle of Act Directive, back to tab 4, page 36, that's the last page in the tab. That provides for the obligation to pay. Um, Article 193, that shall be payable by any taxable person carrying out a taxable supply of goods or services, except where it is payable by another person in the case of referred to uh, in Articles 194 to 199 and 202, which are not relevant. And then flip forward, if you could, um, a couple of pages to page 34. Those are provisions setting out what triggers the liability to that and when that becomes chargeable. So starting in Article 62, for the purposes of this directive, one, chargeable event shall mean the occurrence by virtue of which the legal conditions necessary for that to become chargeable are fulfilled. And two, that shall become chargeable when the tax authority becomes entitled under the law at a given moment to claim the tax from the person liable to pay, even though the time of payment may be deferred. So there you see the distinction being drawn between the chargeable event, which is an occurrence, uh, a real life event, that satisfies the legal conditions necessary for that to become chargeable. And then 
paragraph two um, is about timing, when the tax authority becomes entitled uh, to claim the tax from the person, that's when the tax becomes chargeable. Um, Article 63. Uh, Article 63. The chargeable event shall occur, and that shall become chargeable when the goods or services are supplied. So that's the uh, prima facie rule. And then Article 64 and 65 uh, set out certain um, special cases. So 64, when it gives rise to successive statements of account or successive payments, the supply of goods, other than that consistent supply of goods, etc. In the third term, um, the supply of services shall be regarded as being completed on the expiry of the period for which the statement of account of payment to a late. Uh, member states may provide in certain cases the continuous supply of goods and services over a period of time is to be regarded as completed at least at intervals of one year. Uh, Article 65, where a payment is to be made on account before goods or services are supplied, that shall become chargeable on the receipt of the payment and on the amount received. And then Article 66, um, by way of derogation from Article 63, 64 and 65, member states may provide that that is to become chargeable in respect of certain transactions or certain categories of taxable persons at one of the following times. A, no later than the time the invoice is issued, B, no later than the time the payment is received, and C, where an invoice is not issued or is issued late within a specified period from the date of the chargeable event. So what you see from Article 66, um, and, and this is the article um, which is implemented in the UK by Regulation 90. So what you see from Article 66 is you need a transaction in order for any of that to become chargeable. So member states may provide for that to become chargeable in respect of certain transactions. Um, the timing rule, you'll see, relates only to when that becomes chargeable in Article 66. What it does not do is change the date of the transaction. You still need a chargeable event, a transaction that amounts to a chargeable event for the purpose of Article 62. And the fact and timing of that transaction, of that chargeable event, are not changed by Article 66. And then I, what I need to show you is how the timing provision is implemented in domestic legislation. So if we could start um, back in tab one, page three. Uh, section one, sub two of the VAT Act. That on any supply of goods or services of the liability of the person making the supply and subject to provisions about accounting and payment become due at the time of supply. So the time of supply rules affect when that becomes due. And we say that's when it becomes chargeable, consistent with Article 66 of the Principal VAT Directive. And then section six is the time of supply provision. That's on page seven. Uh, subsection one, the provisions of the section shall apply subject to... So sorry, we, we, where have we gone to? I'm so sorry, it's page seven in tab one. Section six of the VAT Act, time of supply. Subsection 1, the provisions of this section shall apply subject to sections 18, 18b and 18c, which are not relevant, for determining the time when a supply of goods or services is to be treated as taking place for the purpose of the charge to VAT. Uh, and in subsection 3, subject to subsections 4 to 14 below, the supply of services shall be treated as taking place at the time when the services are performed. And if you turn over the page, page 8, um, 
subsection 14, about two thirds of the way down that page, uh, the commissioners may by regulations make provisions with respect to the time at which, notwithstanding subsections 2 to 8 and 11 to 13 above, uh, in section 55, um, a supply is to be treated as taking place in cases where um, A, it is a supply of goods or services for a consideration, the whole or part of which is determined or payable periodically or from time to time or at the end of any period. Uh, and then the last part of subsection 14 at the bottom of the page, and for any such cases as mentioned in the subsection, the regulations will provide for goods or services to be treated as separately and successively supplied at prescribed time or intervals. And that's the provision um, under which regulation 90, the timing rule in our case, is enacted. Um, that's behind tab 2 on page 24. Regulation 90 of the 1995 uh, Value Added Tax Regulations. Subsection 1, subject to paragraph 2 below, where services, except those to which Regulation 93 applies, relevant, where services are supplied for a period for a consideration, the whole or part of which is determined or payable periodically or from time to time, they shall be treated as separately and successively supplied at the earlier of the following times. A, each time that a payment in respect of the supplies is received by the supplier, or B, each time the supplier issues a VAT invoice relating to the supplies. So, looking at the first part, subsection 1, um, where services are supplied for a period, etc., um, that must be a reference to the real-world supply or transaction. It's only where you have a real-world transaction um, that you engage regulation items where they are supplied. So that is all, that's all the legislation I need to take you to for now. Um, if we take a look um, at the first year tribunal's decision below, um, that would be your call binding at... The last tab, not quite the last tab, no tab. Okay. Uh, if your lordship could please go to page 133 of the bundle. So the first year tribunal, quite rightly we say, um, followed the decision in BJ Rice, which I will take you to um, at the actual judgment in due course. But paragraph 34 of the first year tribunal's judgment um, both parties refer to a number of authorities in support of their position. One of the earliest is the decision of the Court of Appeal in B.J. Rice. Uh, and then the facts, the taxpayer in B.J. Rice has supplied tax consultancy... If you're going to read a long chunk, it's easier for us to read it to ourselves. How much of this were you going to read? Uh, if you could please, um, my lord, read to the end of paragraph 36 over the page.
I'm sorry, just as a matter of trivia for non-tax specialists, obviously no Stephen Oliver QC. Why does he say as he then was? What did he become? Uh, he became a tribunal judge. Uh, he was probably Oh, I see. I didn't write that. He became Sir Stephen Oliver, didn't he? Yeah. Which yeah. may be what oh, Mr. Gamby had in Great mind. That I see. Thank you. Well, you're good for my education. And that was, indeed. Um, and after that, if I could please invite you to turn to page 141 in the same tab. Um, and please read to yourselves um, paragraph 70 through to 77 over the page. That's still in the FTT. Do you want to read the whole of 70 to 77? 70 to 77. Yes. Well, we obviously have read that before. But this perhaps as well we read it again. It's fair to say, isn't it, that um, essentially you could see arguments both ways on the statutory construction, but um, he thought that they were authoritatively uh, resolved by Rice. Uh, his ratio really was he was following Rice. Indeed. The, the yeah. FTT found um, against Prudential, um, we say wrongly, um, on the on the proposition that you could it was right to apply regulation 90 in this case to establish a time of supply um, at the point of invoice and payment which will post group and we say that was wrong but nevertheless um, the FTT held um, on the principles established in BJ Rice um, that, that nevertheless was did not generate a back liability of Silverfleet because Silverfleet uh, was not making the supplies in the course of furtherance for business carried on by it its business was treated as carried on by Prudential. So just to understand Mr Gammy's reasoning, aside from the reference to Rice, he seems to be focused particularly on the opening words of Section 43 rather than the disregard. Uh, indeed. He, he's, he's focusing on the, the opening words of Section 43 where it says you treat the business of, I'm paraphrasing, uh, members of the group as carried on by the representative. Yes. And the FTT's decision was overturned by the Upper Tribunal. Um, its decision is in the core bundle behind tab 6. Page 99, number um, 114, summarises uh, their reasoning. Paragraph 114, the bottom of page 99, says, In reaching a decision, we conclude the FTT made the following errors of the law. One, the FTT correctly concluded the subject of the supply chain invoice, and that absolutely was 
not a member of the group at the time, the supply was not subject to the disregard. That's by disregard he means the provision in section 43 sub 1 sub a, providing for supplies made uh, by one member of the group to another to be disregarded. So that's what he means by a disregard. It erred in law in not applying the same analysis and conclusion in respect of the assumption. Um, by the assumption, the upper tribunal means um, the uh, statutory uh, requirement to treat the business carried on by Silverfleet during the group period as carried on by Prudential as a representative member. Yeah. The upper tribunal means by the assumption. Um, the services were not assumed by virtue of section 43 sub 1 to be supplied by Prudential because they were supplied to take place in 2015-16. Uh, 2015-16 was when VAT invoices were raised and payments made. Um, we did not argue that the services were supplied by Prudential. We don't say they were supplied by Prudential. We say that the business of Silverfleet at the time the supplies the transactions took place, the supplies were actually made, um, the business of Silverfleet was treated to be as carried on by Prudential. So we don't say, uh, in the section 43 sub 1, um, we don't say it's, it's, it's treated as supplied by Prudential. Uh, in sub paragraph 2, um, the FTT expressed concern um, as mixing the real world with the VAT world to create a tax charge. But its own approach makes the real world the VAT world in order to avoid a VAT charge. Um, it took services which in the real world were rendered by Silverfleet in the course of its business and applied to them a VAT world treatment in which Silverfleet's business was assumed to be carried on by Prudential. Uh, three, it was a material error of law to regard the position of Silverfleet as being indistinguishable from that of Mr. Rice. Uh, Silverfleet was not entirely outside the scope of VAT when the services were rendered but rather it was subject to a specific set of assumptions and disregards. The FTT therefore erred in regarding itself as bound by BJ Rice to allow Prudential to appeal. Uh, and then finally, four, since none of the decided cases provide a direct authority for the issue in the appeal and the FTT should have given weight to the comments of Lord Hoffman, Lady Justice Arden and Lord Walker in deciding whether to extend the approach adopted by the Court of Appeal and BJ Rice. And just noting that um, the judgments... Uh, of Lord Hoffman and Lady Justice Arden, to which that paragraph refers, um, Lord Hoffman being Saw Materials, Lady Justice Arden, RSA, were both dissenting judgments. Yes, although it's set out in four points, it's really a single point on the construction of the relevant provisions and the approach which they enjoy. Um, followed by saying why the authorities uh, didn't require the FTT to take a different approach. Uh, indeed, the distinguishing BJ Rice from, from the case before yeah. the tribunal. Uh, essentially, on the basis, and you see that in um, subparagraph 3, um, that the upper tribunal considered that it was um, decisive that Mr. Rice was not required to be registered for VAT at the time the supplies were in fact made, so that he was um, outside entirely, that the upper tribunal entirely outside the scope of VAT. Um, as we will see, and I'll take you to um, a decision of the uh, CJEU, um, at the time the investment management services were in fact provided by Silverfleet, uh, Silverfleet could not be treated as a taxable person. It was not a taxable person. It was not permitted. Uh, well, you'll, rather person. than trail the submission, you'll make it in due course. I will. Yes, so we've looked at the two decisions. Um, so we say that the upper tribunal was wrong, um, essentially in the following three ways. Um, first, um, it erred in law in holding that... Um, when a transaction, an event, an occurrence that might provide uh, produce supply, when a transaction takes place between members of the same VAT group, um, the upper tribunal said wrongly, we say, that Regulation 90 applies to determine whether that transaction gives rise to a supply at a particular time. And it is that that determines taxability. 
we say that for the purpose of construction of the legislation, a transaction taking place between members of the same batch group is disregarded. So there is no supply to which Regulation 19 Alternatively, even is if... Alternatively, this is your point two. Uh, this is sort of point one sub two. <laughs> what was sub one? Sub one is that on a purpose of construction, yes, um, see, when you have a transaction taking place between members of the same back group, you don't get... Yeah, okay, that's fine. I just wasn't sure what the structure of your submission was. Alternatively, yeah. Well, alternatively, um, even if it were right to apply Regulation 90, um, that cannot make taxable which was something that was not a taxable supply at the time the transaction took place. And that's because Silverfleet was not then a taxable person. The only taxable person being Prudential, as the representative notes. And that's the BJ Rice point. Hang on. Yep. Um, and then the second point is that the upper tribunal um, erred in the law um, in, in failing to recognise that even if one could apply Regulation 90, um, no VAT liability can arise to Silver Fleet because the supply was not made in the course or furtherance of a business that Silver Fleet was carrying on. Regulation 90, in a timing rule, does not change the business in the course or furtherance of which a supply was made, nor does it change the identity of the person carrying on that business, which in this case was Prudential as the representative member. Uh, and then the third error of law um, that the upper tribunal made, we say, is in holding that this case does not concern the consequence of that grouping. Um, and in so doing, um, the upper tribunal therefore wrongly failed to take into account uh, a number of relevant European and domestic authorities that I'll take you to. Um, essentially, its error is in failing to give effect to the reality that Silverfleet and Prudential were members of the same VAT group when the transactions took place. Aren't you making this overcomplicated? These are three separate consequences of a single issue, which is whether, as a matter of construction, uh, the uh, timing rules in Regulation 90 apply to Section 43. Um, is Isn't that one, once you, if your if your submission on that is right, all these are just consequences of that. If you're wrong about that, that solves all the problems raised by all three of your points. It's essentially two points, um, my, my lord. Um, first of all, whether Regulation ninety applies at all. Point one, because if you are disregarding transactions, which we say you should, made between group members, Silverfleet to Prudential then you don't have services that are supplied when you come to look at Regulation 90, which is a prerequisite for applying that regulation. So you don't get to apply Regulation 90. Do you apply Section 43 first? I mean, in the real world, services were supplied by Silver Fleet to Prudential for consideration. Uh, in the real world, transactions took place between Silver Fleet and Prudential at a time when they were members of the same VAT group and needed to be treated as a single taxable person. But you've jumped ahead. My question was, you say you apply Section 43 first before you apply Regulation 90. And I think your answer indicates that you, your submission does say that. You, you, you start with the real world, in which 
there was a transaction under which services were supplied by Silverfleet to the Prudential, who were two independent businesses with their own businesses in the real world. You say before you get to the time of supply rules, you next go to section 43, take account of the fact they were in the same PAT group, and therefore that real world transaction in fact supplied in the course of Silverfleet's own business to the Prudential is disregarded and treated as if it didn't take place for VAT purposes. So you never get to regulation number. Indeed. You, you, you recognise the reality that when those transactions took place, the two entities were VAT grouped. Well, and they were VAT section grouped. 43. Yes, you say that's a reality. The, the consequence that it's treated as it's deemed not to be a transaction, it's disregarded for VAT purposes, is a VAT consequence. And you say you apply that consequence before you get to Regulation 90. Uh, you, you do. My understanding is that the revenue's position is you do it the other way around. You first say there's a real-world transaction for consideration. Regulation 90 tells you when it took place. It took place in part when you were members of the same VAT group. That's disregarded. And in part when you weren't members of the same VAT group. And that's battable. That, that's the Commissioner's position, yes. Well, yeah. Does it not come down to which you apply first? I mean, the Arbitrary Tribunal at one point said it's a chicken and egg situation. Well, is that not the question that we have to? It, it, one can one can one can think of it as which do you apply first, but really it's a question of how do you construe Section Forty Three and the requirement to treat Silverfleet and Prudential when the transactions in fact took place as a single taxable person. But that, but the answer to that depends on which you take first. You can't. If you had a single entity with, say, two branches, and one was providing services, one branch was providing services to the other branch, um, there is then a demerger at a later point, and you end up with two companies. Um, one keeps the benefit of the services in exchange for making payments to the other entity. There would be no question, and I don't think the commissioners would argue otherwise, that there would be any of that consequence. Because even though you have payments taking place after the demerger, there was no supply. The, the services were provided by one branch to another within the same entity. So when you say payments, you merely mean accounting entries within one company? No, my lord. I'm sorry, I haven't when, explained when myself you say very branches, well. Do you mean separate mm. corporate entities? Or separate. Do you... when, the, when they've demerged, See, I, thought start... you, I thought by merger and demerger, you meant a splitting of a single corporate entity? You start with a single corporate entity with two branches. Yeah, so they well, are not legally separate persons? The branches. Not legally separate persons. No, not legally so at that stage persons. it would just be internal accounting entry? In, in, internal provision of services. Um, so one department provides certain services well, to another department. This isn't helpful because uh, I'm sure you're right, but I mean, so what? S single taxable person, my lord. This is how you're meant to treat members of a VAT group as a single taxable yes. person. So when Silverfleet, in fact, provided the services to Prudential, they were members of the same VAT group. Yes. And we say you treat them yes. as, as the case law You deem them, contrary you to deem reality. Them. Contrary to reality, contrary to reality, but it's a necessary deeming because um, that is what you must do if your VAT group, um, if, if a member state implements the VAT grouping regime. So you treat them as a single taxable person. Yeah. Similar to divisions of the same yep. entity. Definitely. Then, if at a later point that entity demerges into two separate companies, two distinct legal persons, two separate companies. Well, it, it isn't quite the same because if, it, if it's merely within a company, um, there's no real transaction at all. It's just an accounting entry as between yes. two divisions. Precisely, and that is what the disregard in section 43 tells you to do. You, you do disregard what in fact took place between Silverfleet and Prudential because they were VAT grouped. But there, in the case of two, two branches within a single corporate entity, there is no supply for consideration. 
and, and indeed there is no supply for that purposes, a supply for consideration in our case. Well, there is. Because it's just well, all right. But that clearly is in the real world. These are two companies. Real money, will, real services will pass from company one to company two, and real consideration will pass from company two to company one, um, depending how meticulous they are. In principle, one will have invoiced the other. Um, and it is also part of that reality that when all that, when the, when the transactions take place, the two are VAT grouped. That is also part of the reality, is that they were VAT grouped. And they were what? Group, Sorry, I didn't hear They that. were VAT grouped. They were members of the same VAT well, group. Well, you say that's a reality. It's not a reality. It's a, it's a legal fiction. Well, it's, or it's, are the consequences of them being VAT grouped is a legal fiction. The consequences may follow the legal provisions, but that the two were members of the same VAT group is a reality. Mm -hmm. And from that reality flows the consequences, one of which is that, well, the, mo the, the only one consequence really, which is you treat all the members of that VAT group as a single taxable person at that time. And really what that means is that you treat the transactions that in fact took place between Silverfleet and Prudential as something that took place within a single taxable person. It has no VAT consequence. And that's what section 43 sub 1 sub A means by you disregard those. Yes, in circumstances where it applies. In circumstances where it applies. Which depends on the timing of the supply. It, it's unfortunate, perhaps, that, the, that section 43 sub 1 sub A uses the word supply, um, which is liable to generate confusion. But it cannot be right, we say, in this case, for a VAT consequence to arise from what happened, what took place between Silverfleet and Prudential when the two were VAT grouped. Because you could only get a VAT charge on Silverfleet if you give that consequence to what you allow what took place between Silverfleet and Prudential during a period when they were members of the same VAT group. You allow that to have that consequence. And that goes against a treatment of all the members of that VAT group at that time as a single taxable person. Things that take place within a single taxable person should not be giving rise to VAT consequences. But what the commissioners say, what the upper tribunal said, is that you have to lift those transactions out of the VAT group and give them VAT consequence. That's rather tendentious way of putting it. They say that they don't fall within the VAT group um, because of the timing of the relevant supply. Yeah, so it's not do. lifting them. I mean, it depends who's right, whether you just... Uh, indeed, they do, they do say that, but in order to do that, you have to apply Regulation 90. And Regulation 90, as you saw, says where services are supplied for a period for consideration, etc. When you have transactions taking place within a VAT group, services are disregarded. And it is not really a chicken and egg situation when you think of it, when, when you bear in mind that Section 43 must be construed so as to be compatible with Article 11. That's my leasing. I don't need to take you there. It's, it's in your bundle, a paragraph. Um, authorities have 17 of my leasing. But uh, it can't be controversial that you construe Section 43 so as to be compatible with the purpose of Article 11 of the principle of that directive. Okay, can I just talk around that for a moment? Um, as I understand it, when you look at the reason for Article 11, you find it's about administrative convenience, really. There's, there's no policy of giving an exemption. Uh, it was thought to be administratively convenient within a group. Uh, and of course, if everybody's, ta everybody's supplying bettable services, it's tax neutral anyway, because the recipient of the services will recover as input tax, whatever it would have paid to the other member of the group. So it's, so the policy is administrative convenience while you're members of a group. Now, why does that policy 
say that you should win in construing section 43? Why does the administrative convenience continue to apply once you've left the group? Well, um, the purpose of Article 11 has been considered in um, uh, a couple of European cases that um, perhaps would be convenient for me to take you to um, now, but merely to say this, which is it must form part um, of administrative convenience that you do not need to have regard for that purposes to anything that takes place inside a group. And what the commissioners are arguing for in this case is that you do have regard to what took place inside a VAT group. Charlie, you've changed your tense there. You, you say that you shouldn't have regard to anything that takes place within a group. And then you say the commissioners say that you shouldn't have regard to things that took place. Uh, so we're, we're now dealing with something that is happening when it's no longer part of the group. Namely, the payment. That, 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 that's because I changed my tense. Because when you come to look at Regulation 90, you're looking at a later time, which is when the invoices are raised and the payments are made. Um, but perhaps it's convenient for me to take you to those um, European cases. Um, let's start in Commission in Ireland, which is Authorities Bundle, Tab 19. Irish um, VAT. Um, it permitted um, a VAT grouping where at least one of the members was a taxable person um, and, and they were bound in the relevant way. Uh, the European Commission took the view that uh, insofar as it permitted non-taxable persons to be members of the VAT group, um, the Irish legislation was incompatible with Articles 9 and 11 of the Principle VAT Directives, um, held that um, it wasn't apparent from Article 11 that non-taxable persons could not be included in a VAT group. Um, if I could please ask you to turn to page 307. Um, this is in... Um, Advocate General Yaskinen's opinion. So paragraph 28, the Advocate General says, at the outset it's useful to recall that according to the settled case law of the court, in determining the meaning of the provision of European Union law, its objectives, context and wording must all be taken into account. Um, I'll first consider the wording of Article 11 in light of legislative history before examining its context and objectives. Um, then at D in the margin of the start of legislative history and wording, um, and go through it. Um, and then on page 308, paragraph 36, we conclude, therefore, Article 11 of the VAT Directive allows member states to regard as a single taxable person any legally independent persons established in the territory of the member state, provided they are closely bound to one another by financial, economic, and organisational links. Uh, this conclusion is in conformity with the principle of legal certainty, which is particularly important in taxation matters, where not only taxable persons and tax authorities, but also the member states, need to rely on the clear and precise wording of the relevant European Union law. Um, and then he, he, he dismisses the commissioners, the commission's part, uh, argument. Um, what, was, what was the question? The question was whether... Um, the principle of that directive permitted non-taxable person, someone who wasn't a taxable person, to be a member of a VAT group. The Commission said you couldn't do that. Uh, the European Court said you could permit non-taxable persons to be members of a VAT group. Thank you. Um, and then uh, point B of the opinion, um, the Attorney General goes on to consider the objectives and context of the VAT grouping provisions. Um, over the page, page 309, uh, paragraph 39. Uh, Do we not need to notice paragraph 38? Paragraph 38, um, the explanatory memorandum indeed for the proposal to the proposal for the sixth VAT directive states in the interest of simplifying administration or the combating abuses, e.g. the splitting of one economic operator among several taxable persons, 
so that each may benefit from a special scheme. Uh, member states will not be obliged to treat as a taxable person those whose independence is purely a legal technicality. Um, the legislative history of the provision establishing VAT groups reveal no other aims. For the Commission, those goals preclude the inclusion of non-taxable persons in the VAT group. And then 39, in order to understand the purpose of VAT grouping within the context of the broader VAT regime, account needs to be taken of the effect VAT groups have on fiscal neutrality. This entails consideration of the practical effects of registering a VAT group. This is significant because these effects may well provide the motivation for economic operators to be involved in VAT grouping, provided that they have a choice in this respect under the applicable national legislation. And then C, the VAT grouping option in the broader context of, VAT regime, of the VAT regime. Uh, the forming of a VAT group results in creation of a single... How much tax do you want us to read here? Um, if you could please, um, my Lord, read um, paragraph... 40 through to four, to the end of 42, yeah. uh, and then on page 310, uh, if you could read um, from D. Well, the sideline uh, question. Yes, so the sideline, yes, indeed. Very well, give us a moment. So just points to emphasize um, creation of single taxable person that is in all respects comparable to a taxable person consisting of only one entity, that's paragraph 40. Um, that is consequence of that grouping. Um, Paragraph 42, the establishment of VAT group initiates the VAT liability of the VAT group and terminates the separate tax liability of those of its members who were taxable persons for VAT purposes before joining the group. Um, and at the end, the last sentence of, sorry, the penultimate sentence of paragraph 42, transactions, transactions between individual members of the group and which remain therefore within the group are considered to have been carried out by the group for itself. Consequently, a VAT group's internal transactions do not exist for VAT purposes. And if you refer back um, to Article 66 of the Principal VAT Directive, which, which um, gave Member States the power to enact timing provisions, um, that's tab 4, uh, page 35. By way of derogation from Article 63, 64, and 65, member states may provide that that is to become chargeable in respect of certain transactions, etc., uh, no later than the time of the invoice or payment. But you need a transaction. And what the Advocate General is saying here is that VAT Group's internal transactions do not exist 
It doesn't just come up against the same question, which I've been suggesting to you is the only real question, which is, uh, does the uh, group regime apply to this particular transaction at the relevant time? Yes, and we, we say it does, because when they're talking about transaction, they're talking about what happens in the, in the world. The actual performance of the services by Silverfleet to Prudential, which undoubtedly took place when the two were members of the same VAT group. And, and I'll just um, make a couple more points um, on the basis of, of what the Advocate General said here. Um, paragraph 46, um, in certain situations, members of a VAT group may gain economic benefit from belonging to the group. This, in my opinion, is simply an inevitable consequence flowing from the basic fiscal policy choice of a member state to permit VAT grouping. Um, and, and just to be clear, the reason why this case matters prudential is that it does not charge VAT on all its services. Otherwise, it would recover the input tax. Uh, indeed. Um, but um, uh, paragraph 49, um, uh, that liability says can and does have an impact on structure and functioning of business activities. Um, VAT grouping allows member states to diminish the influence of VAT on the way economic operators organise themselves. It can do this by reducing the difference in cost between producing a service in-house, that's a real-life concept, producing a service in-house, and buying it from a dependent supplier with separate legal personality. Thus, VAT grouping supports fiscal neutrality by enabling appropriate business structures without negative consequences in terms of VAT liability. And at the risk of repeating myself, going back to the example that we were talking about earlier, a single legal entity that um, where, where one division might provide investment management services to another division would not expect any VAT consequence to flow from that from those transactions. And, and that, the Advocate General said, is what is the same purpose VAT grouping is intended to achieve. So when Silverfleet and Prudential were members of the same VAT group, provisions of services by one to the other should generate no VAT consequence. And then the next case um, is just the next tab over, tab 20. I'm sorry to interrupt, my lords, um, but um, if your lordship doesn't have, Lord Newey doesn't have already um, the court's um, affirmation of the point he put to my learned friend before she went to the island case, that is found in the island case itself, um, at page 319, paragraph 47. Where the court directly picks up on. So this is the grand chamber, in fact. Uh, yes, it is. I think um, it, it, it picks up. Uh, it didn't pick up on everything the advocate general said, but it did pick up on what the your lordship drew attention to in paragraph thirty-eight of the AGO. So that's the court's statement. Um, Yes, you're going to take us, to, unless you want to say anything about that, you're going to take us to Laurentia. Uh, paragraph 47 um, simply confirms, as my learned friend has said, that um, uh, the grouping regime is intended uh, either in the interest of simplified administration with a view to combating abuses. Sorry, that was paragraph 47 um, on page 319. I see, sorry, yes. I've moved on to the other case, yes. I'm with you. Yep. The next case is in tab 20. Yes. Um, I won't attempt to pronounce it. It's well, La call it Laurentia. Laurentia. Thank you, my lord. Um, so, one of the issues in Laurentia um, is whether the um, what was then Article 4, Sub 4 of the Sixth Directive, now Article 11 of the Principle of That Directive, um, precluded national legislation which reserved the right to form a VAT group solely to entities with legal personality uh, and linked to the controlling company of the group in, in a relationship of subordination. Um, except where those two requirements constitute measures which were appropriate and necessary in order to um, achieve the objective of seeking to prevent abusive practice or behaviour. Um, 
and also confirmed that Article 4, Sub 4 of the 6 Directive is not considered to have done... Sorry, where, you're reading from somewhere, but I'm, where? I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I'm simply summarising, reading from the bottom of the head note. It's on page 322. Okay, um, okay well, we can see that. The help yep. part. I was just reading um, Sub 2 and Sub 3. Yeah. If I could then um, ask you to turn to page 332. same point that we've seen uh, made by the Advocate General in uh, Commission and Ireland, that paragraph 48, this is the Advocate General Ngozi, uh, in practice, since the VAT group is regarded as a single taxable person, the entities forming it do not continue to submit VAT declarations separately or to be identified within and outside their groups as taxable persons. In 49, it follows that the VAT group's internal transactions that is to say, transactions effected for consideration between the constituent members do not exist in principle for VAT purposes. Um, the right to deduct input tax is therefore determined not on the basis of transactions between members of the group, but solely on the basis of the group's transactions with third parties. Um, and all that's consistent with what um, the Commission, the European Commission, has said um, in its communication on uh, the VAT grouping regime. That's in the authorities bundle behind tab 23. Um, so you can see page 374 at the top. This is a communication from the Commission to the Council and the European Parliament on the VAT group option provided by Article 11. Um, and then page 375, so the Commission sets up the background and then the paragraph down from the top of that page. Against this background, the aim of this communication is to explain the Commission's view on how the provision of Article 11 should be translated into practical arrangements whilst respecting the basic principle of the community VAT system. That's page 376. Just before you go to 376, if, if we look at the first three paragraphs under the heading original objective, yes. you get what we've seen earlier being expanded slightly. Indeed, um, the concept was introduced um, in the sixth directive to allow administrative... Well, no need to read it aloud. Um, so page 376, uh, paragraph 3.2, the main purpose of the VAT grouping provision or option if I could ask your lordships to read uh, section 3.2, um, which continues over the page, um, but stop at 3.3. Uh, As the Commission says, by joining a VAT group, the group members for VAT purposes dissolve itself from any possible simultaneously existing legal forms, instead becomes part of a new separate taxable person for VAT purposes, namely the VAT group. Um, in other words, for VAT purposes, while Silverfleet and Prudential were in the same VAT group, um, they were not, they were dissolved of their separate legal forms, but they formed part of a separate taxable person. Um, and so the transactions, in fact, taking place between them during that period can have no VAT consequence. Um, and then finally, if you could please turn to page 382. Uh, this is paragraph 3.4.2 talks about treatment of supplies to or from third parties. Um, 
And the last sentence, the VAT situation for group and the treatment of its incoming and outgoing transactions are fully comparable to those for taxable persons with different branches. Uh, and then paragraph 3.4.3, intra-group supplies. Um, if I could invite the lordships to read that paragraph, please. This is all pretty obvious stuff, isn't it? Uh, indeed, my lord, I would have thought so. But when, when Silverfleet and Prudential were, in fact, that grouped, um, anything that took place between them during that period, such as the, in, the actual provision of the investment management services, should have no bad consequence. Uh, and indeed, my lord, that should be obvious. Um, Yes. Um, and then um, two uh, domestic cases just confirming um, what you have just seen in Commission in Ireland and Laurentia. Um, the first is Taylor Clark, which is Authorities Tab 13. Turn to page 191, a couple of pages in. This is the judgment of Lord Hodge. Um, for whom, uh, read uh, Conworth, Briggs and Mans agree. So the paragraph one is an appeal concerning a claim for repayment of unduly levied VAT in the context of that group of companies. The question is whether Taylor Clark uh, can be treated as having made claims for repayment within the time limit, etc. When another company, which was formerly a member of the VAT group um, and not Taylor Clark, made the relevant claim. So that was what the case was about. Paragraph two, as I discussed below, the idea of a VAT group of companies is introduced to simplify the collection of VAT by A, ignoring intergroup transactions, and B, by treating supplies by or to any member of the group in their dealings with entities outside the group as transactions by a single taxable person. So the, the focus there is on, on transactions. Um, and then page 196. Uh, so Lord Hodge there um, set out article 11, starting at the bottom of page 195. Uh, and then at the top of page 196, he says two points may be made about this provision. First, it is permissive. There's no obligation on a member state to institute such a regime. And secondly, is not prescriptive. It does not lay down template as to how a member state will treat a group of persons as a single taxable person. Um, and my learned friend uh, makes the point um, that there is no obligation and that it's not prescriptive. It's not, um, um, it doesn't tell member states exactly what to do. But nevertheless, um, it, it ought to be uncontroversial that the UK having decided to implement a VAT grouping regime um, it must be construed so as to be compatible, so far as possible, and it is possible, um, to be compatible with the purpose of Article 11, which we've just seen. Um, and then, finally, just a little bit at the bottom of page 196, um, so at paragraph 22, he talks about saw materials, which we will come on to very shortly, um, and what Lord, Lord Nolan says there. Um, 
he says he doesn't consider Lord Nolan to be talking about rep the representative member to be dealing on behalf of other members of the VAT group. Um, section 43, uh, Lord Hodge says at the bottom, Section 43 is not concerned with intergroup legal arrangements for group members. It's concerned with dealings in relation to VAT with entities outside the VAT group and with the HMRC, including the disregard for intergroup supplies in relation to the liability to tax. Uh, and then Lloyd's Banking, which is behind tab 15, uh, this is a Court of Appeal decision. This case is about, you can see on page 217, which is in Lady Justice Rose's judgment, paragraph 3, uh, the issues that arise in these appeals concern who has a right to claim back the tax in a situation where the goods or services on which the tax was wrongly levied were supplied by companies which were at the time of the supply members of a VAT group formed pursuant to UK legislation implementation of Article 11. And then page 219, starting with paragraph 14. Uh, the leadership says there are a number of important decisions by the Court of Justice and the European Union clarifying the scope and effect of the VAT grouping provisions. And paragraph 15 talks about Ampli Scientifica, which we will come on to. At paragraph 16, she talks about European Commission in Ireland, which we've seen. Um, paragraph 17, the judgment of the CJEU began its analysis by recalling that in determining the meaning of a provision of EU law, the objectives, context and wording, wording of the law must all be taken into account. Uh, over the page, paragraph 18, um, the court's reasoning in Commission in Ireland followed closely that of Advocate General Yaskinen's opinion in that case, and we've seen that opinion. Um, and then if I could ask you to read to the um, end of paragraph 19, um, you have seen the, um, the quoted part already uh, when we went through Commission Ireland. Yeah. So there you have um, Lady Justice um, uh, Rose, um, she was at the time, um, uh, saying that um, what the Advocate General said in, in Commission Ireland, and closely followed by the court, um, by the court in that case, um, is, is, is right. Um, then uh, I don't need to read you to read through it, but paragraphs um, twenty one through to 23 is the Laurentia case, she makes the same point. Um, at paragraph 26 on page 224, um, she says she was taken to the commission communication, which we've also just seen. And then page 251, please, my lords, um, paragraph 120. Paragraph 120, um, Lady Justice Rose says, the case laws which are inconsistent with the joint appellant submission so that grouping provision should not affect the underlying rights and obligations of the members. Uh, on the contrary, it is a key feature of the VAT grouping, of that grouping, that where companies come together to form a group, there are significant changes to the tax treatment of their supplies. It is not simply a matter of the single taxable person accounting for the same amount of VAT as would have been payable on the member's transaction. Uh, transactions had to be remained independently taxable persons. As Advocate General Yaskinen um, uh, said in Commission in Ireland, Para 42, one important change is that VAT group's internal transactions do not exist for VAT purposes. 
This can bring financial as well as administrative advantages, where, for example, a member of the group makes exempt supplies and can avoid incurring non-deductible input tax by obtaining inputs from a fellow uh, group member. It's an important paragraph. So we say that the, the case law is clear, um, that whilst the VAT group is in existence, internal transactions, that's things that are done for consideration in Section 5 language um, between group members, do, do not exist for VAT purposes. Um, and that's the only way one achieves the objective of Article 11, treating the VAT group as if it were one entity. And, and in so doing, conferring a genuine choice to economic operators as to whether they wish to structure their transactions to be in-house in a single entity or with another entity in the same VAT group. My learned friend makes the point in his skeleton argument that you can't know when a transaction took place without applying the time of supply rules. Um, but that's simply not the case. We know when a transaction takes place, you just look at the reality. We know when these transactions took place. They took place inside of that group during a period um, before Silver Fleet left the VAT group. But you just look at the facts. Will that always be the case? If one can identify transactions that might constitute a supply and give rise to that consequences, uh, it must always be the case that one can identify when the actual transactions took place, even if it's over a period of time. When were the services performed? When did the transfer of ownership take place? How well, uh, sorry. suppose the service consists of... Um, effectively a retainer to supply advice uh, as required, and you get paid for that. And let's assume a very pure case where you don't actually get paid any more if someone does pick up the phone and ask you for advice. And suppose that is in that uh, relationship is in that, that service is uh, in place over um, a period during part of which someone is with one of the, the recipients in the group and, uh, sorry, the uh, suppliers in the group, and part it isn't. When would you say the service was supplied? Um, you'd well, have to have some sort of, you'd either have to prorate or you'd have to have um, some deeming provision, wouldn't you? Well, you would, you would come down to um, uh, Section 5 of domestic legislation directs you. Um, you'd need to decide when something was done for a consideration. When was that thing done? Um, and it may be that in that case, one needs to look at the agreement between the parties, the contract, right. um, to identify what is the thing that is to be done um, and, and when that was done. And it well, may be of course, but, the, but, but how would you apply that to the kind of situation I've put to you? Um, whatever is done whilst the supplier and recipient are in the same VAT group is disregarded, and whatever is done... But what is done are, under the arrangement, under the circumstances i put to you? Um, well, it depends on what the agreement says, but it may yeah, be I'm making, making oneself available. Says. If, if it is making oneself available yes. to receive instructions for example, um, then whilst one is making oneself available during a period, and one is VAT grouped with the, the payer, the recipient, um, then that is disregarded. It is as if one division of a single legal entity is making itself available to do the bidding of another division of right. the same entity. Um, 
once either the supplier or the recipient leaves the VAT group, um, it then becomes a situation where an entity is doing something for another entity. And the supplier is a taxable person carrying on a business. But suppose you were being paid £100,000 for this. Um, what happens when you leave the group halfway through? Is it is uh, the consideration is uh, paid, let us say, at the end of the period? Is the whole of that consideration exempt? Part of the service will have been supplied during the period that you were within the group. Uh, exempt is the wrong word. I'm using loosely. It, it, Chargeable. It seems to me that that is a matter of construction of the agreement to establish what the consideration is paid for. Um, well, it's paid for the, your availability throughout the period. Uh, it, it, um, again, it's a matter of, in my submission, um, construing, looking at the agreement between the parties and saying, as a matter of what is agreed between the parties, is the 100,000 paid Rata for each day we will pay X amount adding up to a hundred thousand. Is it paid in is it to be divided in, up in some other way? But there will be um, on looking at the agreement, construing the agreement, an exercise familiar um, to the courts, um, a way of establishing um, what consideration was given for things that were done in the group and what consideration is given for things that are done outside the group. Well, I give the example not to know what the right answer is, but just to test whether it is in fact necessary in any regime of this kind to have provisions fixing for certain sorts of ongoing or continuous services when they are to be treated as having been supplied. You say no, in the absence of provisions, you might have one or two tricky factual situations but there will always be an answer is that right there will always be um one can always establish from the facts whether something was done inside a group yes, I um, see. and um i think no one is arguing in this case that if silver fleet had continued to provide investment management services to prudential um, when the two were no longer members of the same VAT group, that those transactions should not potentially have that consequence. Well, the next case I'd like to take you to is Thorn Materials. It's a House of Lords um, case. Um, it's in the authorities bundle behind tab 7. Um, Lord Hoffman just so you know, when you're reading um, the judgments, Lord Hoffman dissented. Um, Lord Nolan gave a judgment uh, with which Lord Brown Wilkinson and Lord Lloyd both agreed. Um, that's right at the beginning, on page, on bottom of page 75. And um, uh, Lord Clyde agreed with the outcome, but gave his own judgment uh, towards the end of the report. On page 76 at the top um, begins Lord Nolan's judgment. Um, he sets out the facts and the issue. Um, if you could read from A in the margin down to the paragraph ending between C and D, so just the, the first two paragraphs.
Yes. Uh, so 90% of the price paid um, inside of that group, 10% are paid outside. The actual transaction took place outside the group. Um, note there was no argument in that case that it was right to apply the timing provision because the actual transaction took place outside the VAT group. Nobody was arguing that that had to be disregarded. The question was, what does it mean to disregard the 90% supply that took place inside the VAT group? Did it mean you only pay tax on the 10% or on the 100 um, And then if I could ask you to turn to me. Page 78, please. Uh, at the top of page 78 there, Lord Nolan set out the timing provisions in that case. And let's read um, A through to C. Bottom of page 78, um, G through to uh, the end of that first paragraph on page 79, which is the party's arguments. Towards the bottom of page 79, you see that Article 10 provides. So Lord Nolan setting out Article 10 of the Corporate Standard 6 of that directive. Um, now it's Article 62 and 63 of the principle of that directive, which we've seen. It draws the distinction between chargeable events and when tax becomes chargeable, uh, and defines when the chargeable event occurs and when tax becomes chargeable. Then Lord Nolan says at the bottom of page 79, this article read with Article 5.1 is, I think, um, helpful in emphasising the subject of tax liability is the supply of the goods in the sense of the transfer of ownership in them, i.e. the real life occurrence, the thing that is done, um, in, in our case, the, the actual performance of the investment management service. So the, the subject of tax liability is the supply of the goods in the sense of the transfer of ownership in them which normally occurs, as in the present case, at the time of delivery. Um, the article authorises tax to be charged uh, by virtue of Article 10.2 and Article 5.1 in advance of the transfer of ownership where there's been a prior payment on account. Uh, but that does not displace the necessity for a transfer of ownership to follow in fact. Otherwise, there will be no chargeable event and no justification for the imposition of the tax. And if I could then invite your lordships to read, to continue um, from there until the paragraph, uh, the end of the paragraph ending at E in the margins. Yes. So the, the important part, um, the second part of that, that paragraph, um, the corollary for present purposes, uh, which again I understand Mr Fleming to accept um, the commissioners in that case, 
um, was if the sequence of events and presentation were reversed, the sale agreement and advance payment had taken place before materials and home became members of the group, but the agreement had been completed after that group, any tax charge on the advance payment could afford to be refunded. Um, and the important part, that the transfer of ownership in the goods, and thus their supply, and thus their supply, would duly have taken place. In reality, yes. Um, but this would have to be disregarded under Section 29, um, that is now Section 43. Um, and so for the purposes of the charge to tax, the chargeable event anticipated by the charge of tax upon the advance payment would have failed to materialise. In other words, an intergroup event, um, that is the thing, the transaction that triggers the charge to VAT, um, if it takes place intergroup, is equivalent to having never taken place. And it cannot, you cannot impose the VAT charge in those circumstances. And you'll see a number of cases um, in, in the course of um, my submissions and, and that of my learned friend. But this, uh, in my submissions, is the closest one comes to guidance on the very point before you. So with that in mind, when you then turn over the page to page 81 and look at the parts that my learned friend will invite you to look at, um, starting just above B in the margin, um, where Lord Nome says, in saying this, um, I also accept Mr. Prosser's further submission that the time of supply rules, including section 5 sub 1, must be applied to determine whether, and if so, when a supply between members of the same group took place. Um, it is essential to apply the time of supply rules in order to determine whether supply took place while the group relationship still existed, um, etc. Um, Lord Nolan is very much talking about what happened in Thought Materials itself which is that the transfer of ownership, the transaction itself, took place outside the VAT group. His lordship cannot be talking about, to my submission, um, a situation in the present case where the transaction, the supply, the, the transfer of ownership in goods or the performance of the investment management services in our case actually took place inside a VAT group because he had just observed not three paragraphs earlier, that no VAT would be due in those circumstances. Notwithstanding the application of any timing rules. That's the judgment um, of three um, law lords of panel of five. Um, then, then you've got, starting on page 82, Lord Hoffman's judgment. Um, bearing in mind it is dissenting, so to the extent that what Lord Hoffman says is inconsistent with what Lord Nolan and the majority say, um, one ought to take into account uh, what the majority has said and not what the dissenting judgment says. Can I go back to what Lord Nolan said at the top of the page, 1113, because you predicted this Tim Mantle would rely on what he says there. I can see why you say that, because what he appears to say is you have to apply the time of supply rules to determine whether a supply of two members of the same group took place. And that seems to be contrary to your submission, which you first decided whether a supply took place, and only if a supply did take place do you apply the time of supply rules. It's the, the term supply is not perhaps um, particularly helpful. Um, what, what Lord Nolan is saying um, in, in the passage um, on page 81 um, is that when it's con uncontroversial, he must be saying this in light of what he said three paragraphs earlier, um, in light of the fact that 
uncontroversially, one has transactions that are taking place outside of ad group, then in order to determine whether anything took place inside of ad group, you have to apply the time of supply rules. Um, but clearly, it was his lordship's view that even if you apply the time of supply rules, which he does in his observation um, on page 80, we've just been to, he does apply the time of supply rules because there's a prepayment there um, that has triggered a VAT charge that's being paid. But you have to refund it because the actual transfer of ownership, the transaction that gives rise to the supply, has to be disregarded because it happened inside a VAT group between members. Now, um, my learned friend may make the point, um, I, I believe, I'm right in saying he makes it in his skeleton argument. Uh, he says the timing rule in store materials is different. Um, if you look at, um, he went to it, but I didn't read it out. Um, it's on page 78. Um, it, it's what was then section 5, sub 1. It says, if before the time applicable under subsection 2, uh, the person making the supply issues the tax invoice in respect of it, or if before the time applicable under paragraph A or B of subsection 2, that section he receives payment, um, the supply shall, to the extent covered by the invoice or payment, be treated as taking place at the time the invoice is issued or the payment is received. Um, and the commissioners say, ah, but this is different because you, you only treat, it is one supply. Um, and what happens is that um, you, you, you only treat a part of it as being disregarded. Whereas in our case, it's different because Regulation 90 invites you to treat the supply as separately and successively supplied each time an invoice or a payment um, is rendered or made. But there is no suggestion in the observation of Lord Nolan on page 80 that had 100%, had the prepayment been of 100% of the price, the outcome would have been any different. He says in terms, um, the transfer of ownership in the goods and thus their supply would duly have taken place. But this would have to be disregarded under section 29. And so for the purposes of the charged tax, the chargeable event anticipated by the charge of tax upon the advance payment would have failed to materialise. It could have been a 90% prepayment, it could have been a 50% prepayment, it could have been a 100% prepayment, which under the timing provision would mean that the whole supply, to the extent of 100%, is treated as taking place at the time the invoice is issued or payment received. Nevertheless, Lord Nolan says, you don't have a VAT charge because you have to disregard what actually happened. So, so the timing, the different timing provisions is not an answer. The, um, the next case we need to look at is um, Svenska, which is another House of Lords um, decision. It's the next tab is tab 8. What happened in Svenska? Um, was that Svenska um, was the UK subsidiary of a Swedish bank. Um, the Swedish bank has also set up a branch in London to carry out um, its business. So you had Svenska, which was its own legal entity, the subsidiary of the, the bank, and then you had London branch of the bank. Svenska provided certain management services to London branch. Um, at a time when Svenska and London Branch were not members of the same VAT group, they were not permitted to be. At a later point, before any invoice had been rendered or payment made for those services, um, Svenska and the London Branch became VAT grouped. Um, and the appeal concerns uh, only the supplies that were in fact made by Svenska to the London Branch before they became VAT grouped. Um, you see that, um, just to confirm that, that, that page 94 
um, back to the top there, uh, last sentence of the sort of half paragraph at the top, the issue in this present case related to the period from 1st of June 1997 to 31st of July 1991, uh, they became that fruit on the 1st of August 1991. So sorry, again, I wasn't keeping up. The, uh, I'm so sorry, my lord. I see, yes. Yep. So, again, the facts in Svenska, the real world transactions, the things that were done for consideration, were done outside of the VAT group. Not so in our case. So, again, there was no dispute in Svenska that one could apply the time of supply rules because there was nothing to disregard insofar as the actual transactions were concerned. Sorry, I, you, you, you let your voice drop. You said there was no issue in Svenska that... That um, it was right to apply the time of supply rules because insofar as the real world transactions were concerned there was nothing to disregard because they took place outside of that group um, now Svenska claimed back input tax uh, on the inputs it had received, which were then attributable to the management services it provided to London Branch. But it didn't invoice for those services or receive payment for them until after the two had become VAT group. Um, the question in Svenska was whether the commissioners were right that Svenska had to pay back some of the VAT, some of the input tax recovery, because those inputs, because the supplies it made to London branch were treated, as having occurred intra group and therefore disregarded. And so the inputs that Svenska had received were attributed not to taxable supplies, but rather to supplies that the fat group as a whole made via its representative member, some of which were exempt. So that was the question of Svenska. Um, if we could go to please, page 101, 101. Um, this is Lord Hutton's judgment. Um, at F in the margin, um, it says throughout the period between 1987 and 1st of August 1991, Pursuant to the agreement between them, Svenska provided management services to London branch. It is common ground between the parties that Regulation 23 of the 1985 regulations, that is now Regulation 90 of the 1995 regulations, so it was common ground between the parties that Regulation 23 applied to those services. Um, and then his lordship sets out that regulation, um, which you will see looks familiar. And it is very much not common ground case before you, that it is right to apply Regulation 90. So Svenska doesn't help you resolve the issue in this case. Um, and my learned friend um, may well, that they're side sidelined, um, take you to other passages in Svenska that the commissioners say are authority for the proposition that the time of supply rule in what is now Regulation 90 have to be applied in order to determine when a supply took place. And you'll see them um, pages 145, well, sorry, 104 and 105 uh, are sidelined in 106. But in considering those passages when you come to them, um, I invite you to bear in mind the following. The real world transaction in Svenska took place outside of that group. It was common ground in Svenska that Regulation 90, what is now Regulation 90, applied. Um, the issue in Svenska was very different. 
it was whether notwithstanding the application of the timing rule, um, the real life transactions nevertheless remains taxable supplies by Svenska to the London branch, such as Svenska was entitled to keep the tax. You're inviting us to note that it's common ground, not simply because arguably something that's common ground can't give rise to binding authority, but because it was right that it was common ground, because it was a different situation. It was a different situation. Are you saying are you saying Spencer was wrong, but we needn't worry, but the ratio was wrong, but we needn't worry because it wasn't argued, or are you saying the ratio was right? because it was a different situation. Svenska was a very different situation. What I'm saying is the ratio in Svenska does not help you to resolve the issue before you. What do you say the ratio is? Uh, what they decided in Svenska was that um, it was right when you applied the timing rule that one had supplies from Svenska to the London branch that took place intra that group, because that's when the invoices and payments were made. So even though Svenska actually provided the management services before they became that grouped, you treat those as intra group supplies. They were I think just you're saying what the decision was rather than what the ratio was. Uh, the, the ratio. Um, The ratio is the following. Um, perhaps, the, perhaps the most useful point to start is to look at the head notes at page, 90, page 92. Sorry. Uh -huh. Yep. Um, page 92 held um, just above C in the margin on its true construction regulation 23 which is now regulation 90 required tribunals in the courts to apply the artificial concept that notwithstanding any actual physical use uh, upon receipt continuous supply of services would be treated for that purposes as not having been supplied until the earlier of the time when a payment in respect of the services was received or when the supplier issued a VAT invoice a tax invoice Right. And then they talk about the input tax recovery position. Now but the you, premise... Sorry, if you take that as the ratio, if you apply that to our situation, why does Regulation 90 not require tribunals and courts to apply the artificial concept that notwithstanding when the services were actually physically provided, continuous supplies of services were to be treated for VAT for purposes of not having been supplied until, in each case, there was a issue of a tax invoice or, or, or payment. Because in our case, um, for VAT purposes, there is no actual, if I use that language, no actual physical use upon receipt, because the actual physical use or the actual provision of the services took place inside a VAT group, and as we've just seen, you disregard that. It's as if that took place within a single legal entity. That wasn't the case in Svenska. But in Svenska, the practical effect of applying the time of supply rules, as I understand it, is that all the services supplied up to the 31st July 1991, in fact, outside of that group, by the UK company to the Sweden company, were treated for VAT purposes as supplied later when the two entities were in the VAT group. And then you apply the consequences of what that is, which is they're disregarded and therefore um, they can't, the input tax has to be clawed back. I think your submission to us is that that was correct on those facts. That means that Regulation 90 operates 
the services were in fact supplied outside of that heap, to treat them as if they were supplied inside of that heap. It doesn't work the other way around. If they were in fact supplied inside of that heap, regulation 92 does not apply to treat them as if they were supplied outside of that heap. Is that right? Uh, and th th that's, there's nothing... There's that, nothing is particularly... your, that is your submission. That, that it... I'm... I'm, I'm... <laughs> I'm not making submissions on whether Svenska is right or not, but I, I do say this, which is that um, in Svenska, because the actual supplies were made outside of Krug, nobody was arguing that those should be disregarded, have no bad consequence, and so you apply the timing rules. But what is different in our case, and it's unsurprising that it's different um, and creates different outcomes, is that the actual transactions took place inside of that group. So you have to treat them as if they took place, uh, you have to disregard them, as if they took place within a single legal entity. They have no bad consequence. And you don't get around to applying Regulation 90. Um, and that's what Lord Nolan says. In fact, he goes further. He says, even if you applied a timing rule, because there was a prepayment, in our case it was a postpayment, but it was a prepayment, you'd have to refund it. Because the real-world transaction, the thing that would create the supply to which you can apply Regulation 90, has to be disregarded, treated as never having taken place. And so, yes, it is a different analysis, it is a different outcome, but it is the right one. Um, and it is right because it does make a difference whether something is done, the thing that's actually done, is done inside of that group or outside of that group. So, uh, I'm not picking up on this, I just want to be clear, you've obviously been quite rightly thinking on your feet. I think you're saying Svenska is right. You first said you didn't have to say it was right or not. You're saying it is right, but it's a different situation, and the principle applied to get to the result in Svenska doesn't apply in our situation, is that because the services aren't supplied or are supplied within the group. Is that right? The, the outcome in Svenska was about input tax recovery, which is very different. Um, what, I am, what I might say is this. Um, well, just if, picking up on that, yes, the, the actual underlying issue is about input recovery, but it's a necessary step to get to the input recovery that their lordships decided that the supply of services, which is the output bit, is treated by Regulation 90, its predecessor, as taking place inside of that group, even though in, in the real world it didn't. Uh, by, by the application of the timing rule, yes. Um, it it where supplies, where the real world transaction takes place at a time when the supplier and recipient are not members of the same VAT group, um, and it's a continuous supply of services, um, then for the purpose of Regulation 90, services are supplied on a continuing basis, or continuous basis, whatever, however it's phrased, and whatever consequence flows from that, flows from that. And I think that is right, but it is not the case that you apply Regulation 90 when the real world transactions take place, or the completion of the supply, the completion of the transaction takes place inside of that group. That is a very different situation. And that's not Svenska at all. Yeah. The closest so, uh, I'm sorry to turn this into shorthands, but you're mm -hmm. saying, saying that Svenska was right, on its facts. but distinguishable. On its very, very much distinguishable. Um, very, very different facts. If, let's put it this way, if Silverfleet and Prudential had not been members of the same VAT group when Silverfleet provided investment management services to Prudential, I wouldn't be here making the same arguments. Um, and, and repeating myself, but the closest my submission one gets to guidance on the actual issue in this case is what Lord Nolan has said in Thor Materials. It's very clear there. But as you point out, that, that is a different case because there was only one supply. Well, undoubtedly, there was a, it was a supply of goods. And in the real world, the goods only were supplied on one day. And, and the timing of supply rules didn't change that in that case. But in our case, the services were supplied over a period. And the time of supply rules do recognise that services are supplied continuously 
and at the time of supply rules, say where you've got continuous supplies, you, you have separate supplies, separate and successive supplies, and they're determined by when you when you make payment. That seems a very artificial thing to do, but that's what Regulation 90 does. So it's not the same as the situation posited by Lord Nolan in Thorn on page 80, where what he's positing is, is a single supply on a particular day. This is a, Regulation 90 operates in a slightly different way. It's different, but not in a relevant way. Um, what is important is that all the, the entire, it is true that the investment management services were performed over a period of time, but that entire period fell within a period when Silverfleet and Prudential were VAT grouped. So everything that was done in real life was done inside the VAT group. So there's no relevant distinction from saying that single transfer of ownership of goods took place inside a VAT group. Everything in real life that was done was done inside the VAT group. Does that mean that if, this is slightly picking up a question my Lord asked earlier, if Silver Fleets carried on supplying investment management services, maybe for a short time, a matter of days or weeks after the management buyout and after it had ceased to be in the VAT group, then the case would be entirely different because where the supply of services straddled both inside the group and outside the group, you could only determine how much of the consideration was VATable by looking at the time of supply rules, which not only tells you when supplies take place, but how much of the consideration is, is, is vatable on each occasion, isn't it? My Lord, you look at the reality. You say, insofar as the actual transactions took place when Silverfleet and Prudential were VAT grouped, you disregard that. That's a nullity. It has no VAT consequence. If then Silverfleet, after it left the VAT group, continued to provide investment management services for however long that may have been, then that is not disregarded, at least not under the VAT grouping rules. So that is a situation where services are supplied on a continuing basis, etc. And you apply Regulation 90 to those supplies, and that creates whatever outcome, whatever VAT consequence it may create. But nevertheless, you disregard everything that's taken place while Silverfleet and Prudential were VAT grouped. What we've got... On the facts of this case, so we have two types of payment to Silverfleet. One is ongoing annual management fees, which are paid as and when the management takes place. But the other are performance fees. And performance fees obviously only get paid at the back end, and everybody knew they were going to be paid at the back end because you can only then measure the performance. So in the case I posited where the investment management straddled the leaving the group, how would you attribute those performance fees to intra-group services and outside group services? You could only do it by applying the time of supply rules, couldn't you? Well, I, 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 with respect, I don't think that is the case. Um, you, you would have performance fees. Um, but bear in mind, First of all, that when Silverfleet left the VAT group, um, a great deal of um, contractual, complex contractual arrangements were entered into to provide for ongoing supplies, how they were going to be paid for, etc. Um, so we're rather speculating that the same agreement would have covered the intra-group period and the post-group period, if I put it that way. Um, but even speculating that the same agreement would have covered that, which on, on the facts um, seems unlikely given in reality what happened when Silverfleet left and the number of agreements that that, that generated, um, it would be for the parties and failing agreement, the court, to find a way 
of reasonably and rationally apportioning the performance fees to supplies that um, are supplies that are not to be disregarded. And that's not an exercise um, that will be strange to the courts. Um, But the, 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 it's all speculation, but the reality may well have been, given the parties involved and what happened in reality, that such a situation would have been provided for. So just, just pursuing your logic a moment, the, the logic is that where you have a supply or transaction, a supply of a service straddling the demerger, you then have to work out the extent to which the consideration is attributable to post-demerger supply because on your thesis everything deep pre-demerger is to be disregarded uh, indeed Every, everything everything pre-demerger is disregarded it's it's as if um, um well going back to my example where you have a single legal entity with different divisions it might demerge into two um, separate legal entities two separate companies um, one continues to supply services to the other um, there would be and, and and receives consideration for it. There would be a way to determine how much of that consideration is for the supply made after the demerger. And would we get any help on that from any statutory provision or regulation? Um, if you bear with me, my lord, I will have a think over the short adjournment. You were saying um, that in a case where, you say in the case that Kai were putting to you, you'd ultimately have to do a rational apportionment, and you say that's a case that courts sometimes have to do. You said, in fact, the parties could do it, but the courts would do it by default if they couldn't agree. Is that a correct analysis from a tax point of view? The parties couldn't agree anything, or rather anything that parties that wouldn't be determinative it would be there would be an there would for your system to work conceptually there would have to be an objective right answer uh, which the commissioners would take a view on and if uh, you didn't like that the uh, party who didn't like it would have to appeal to the courts you're right my lord it's um, my apologies um, that the parties may agree uh, that certain amount of the consideration is a portion to the post group supplies but the commissioners may take a different view um, and and in that case yes it would it would fall to be determined by a tribunal of court thank you well you'll come back to my my lord's question after the short agenda which is fine and Better not to do these things on the hoof if you don't know the answer. Yeah. Um, so, still, still, still in Svenska. Um, just two more things um, to note. Um, first, B.J. Rice, which we will come on to, but uh, it was it was um, it was cited to the court. Um, but nothing is said about it. Um, and my commissioners make the point that BJ Rice has been, um, um, uh, you need to severely limit what you can take from BJ Rice. But um, page 92 of tab 8. Um, yes, we can see it was, it was cited. See nothing. it was cited. Yeah. But no, nothing is said about BJ Rice yeah. and Svenska. Um, also, Svenska was decided in 1999. So that's, that's before um, Commission in Ireland and Laurentia and Taylor Clark and Lloyd's Banking. So it's before all those cases. you say that it would or should have been different had those cases already been decided? But I'm not sure what the input No, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that, my lord. I'm, no. I'm simply saying that um, whatever point the commissioners may make about um, Svenska being authority for um, a certain outcome, which is you don't disregard the intragroup supply, you apply the time of supply rules, you have a bad consequence. Um, I invite you to bear in mind that um, you now have the guidance of Commission in Ireland and Laurentia, which says you disregard intragroup transactions, they have no consequence. Yes, that's that's it. Thank you. 
Um, quick look, um, if I may, at page 105. So we're still in Svenska, we're still in tab 8. It's page 105. Again, this, this is the bit that, um, that the commissioners rely on. Um, it's, uh, it's the first three paragraphs, so A through to just above D. Um, if perhaps I could just invite you to read the, those paragraphs yourself. Sorry, which page? Um, page 105. Thank you. And it's the three paragraphs at the top. Yes. So when you come to look at that um, again, um, part of the commission, was certainly in their skeleton argument, um, bear in mind that the, the argument um, of Mr. Milne in that case, um, the last part of the paragraph, the first paragraph, is that the regulation, the timing regulation, did not prevent the services, in fact supplied by Svenska to the London branch prior to the 1st of August 1991, being taxable supply. So it's a very different argument. Mr. Milne was trying to argue that the deemed supplies under Regulation 90, which were treated as made intra-group, um, ought to remain taxable supplies if the real-world transaction giving rise to them occurred at the time when the supply would have been taxable. That's the point that was being argued. And that's not the argument in our case. So. Anything that Lord Hutton says um, is directed to that argument, which is not ours. Um, we say that Regulation 90 cannot impose a VAT charge. It can't create a taxable supply. Whereas the matter of fact, when the underlying transactions took place, um, it took place inside of that. Um, and then the, the commissioners say um, the skeleton argument, paragraph 25, um, I don't know if you want me to take you to it, but um, uh, it's for your, for your notes. It's in the core bundle, uh, tab 4, page 61, the commissioner's skeleton argument, paragraph 25. They say that Lord Nolan's observations um, in Thor materials relate to the consequence of applying the disregard but not to whether or not the disregard applied. Um, not sure I understand this. If we look back at Lord Nolan, sorry to jump back into Thor materials, but um, it's tab seven of the authority on page 80. Sorry, we will, but surely this is the point you made, you yourself made to us, or am I miss... Indeed. Un he, maybe, he, maybe Mr. Mantle is using a slightly different word to describe it. It's not about the consequence, it's about whether um, the timing provision applies at all. Uh, oh, I see. Well, okay, sorry, uh, I jumped in. Maybe I've misunderstood where you're going. Yep. Sorry, not, not keep, the yeah, keep going with your submission. The, the disregard. Apologies, the disregard. Um, quick point, perhaps I'm late. So, so where are we? Warranted, but we're in tab 7, yep. page 80. Yes. Uh, so I see the particular passage that we've been focusing on. Exactly. Um, yes. I'm simply meeting the Commissioner's um, point that what Lord Nolan says there um, relates to 
the consequence of applying the disregard, um, but not whether or not it applies. Um, but quite clearly, you can see Lord Nolan says, um, the transfer of ownership in the goods and thus their supply would duly have taken place, but this would have to be disregarded under section 29, etc. So he, he is talking about whether you apply the disregard, and the answer is yes, you do. Um, so it's not merely about the consequence of applying it, which is what the Commission is saying. Now, um, I'm, I'm about to move on to B.J. Rice. Um, mm -hmm. I know you have about 10 minutes for a short adjournment. Um, would your lordships like to rise now, or shall I... Well, unless you minutes? want us to for some particular reason. I think it's easier just to stick to the session. We, we may not be able to finish everything you have to say about B.J. Rice in 10 minutes, but we'll certainly be able to get into it. Um, so, B.J. Rice. Um, now, this, this is um, moving on in my argument. So we have been talking about why Regulation 90 doesn't apply at all, because you disregard the, the intra-group transactions. Assuming that I'm wrong, and you do apply the Regulation 90, uh, that nevertheless, what it can't do is create a taxable supply, uh, something that is taxable on silver plate. And to the extent that um, the Commission is saying the skeleton argument um, is that we accept that if Regulation 90 applies, uh, then we lose, um, that's not the case. Um, so BJ Rice is in the authorities bundle behind tab 6. Page 62. Perhaps if I might invite your lordship to read the, the head note all the way through to um, the top of page 63 to yourself. Well, we will if you want us to, but I think... It's not, it's not complicated. Well, it's not complicated, but it'll take quite a long time to read. <laughs> all right, well, let's see, really, but the truth is we've all looked at BJ Rice. It's, been, it's at the centre of, of, of your submissions and therefore of our pre-reading. But we'll quickly read through it, yeah, just remind ourselves. Is, is it any more complicated than the, the taxpayer supplied services for £150 at a time when he was not really too rich? He didn't have to be. Roasted off as a bad debt and later received payment of £150 when he was VAT registered. That's yeah. essentially it. Um, Do we need any more than that? Doesn't need yeah. more than that. Um, <laughs> Commissioner said in that case that. Um, um, uh, because payment was only received after he became uh, registered, that's when you treat the supplies having occurred and therefore taxable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in that case, emboldened by our uh, not going to read that note, that's what we've all understood, but I'm not sure we've all been able to put it so succinctly. Um, so then on page 64, um, this is in the judgment of Lord Justice Stoughton. Um, he Stop. says, oh, my apologies. Um, he sets out the um, relevant provisions, section 2, sub 1 of the 1983 Act. This is the charge to tax. Um, and then he says this, I'm reading from um, just above little e in the margin. Um, it is said, as far as I can see correctly, that there are four elements in that subsection. Um, there must be one. A supply of goods or services in the United Kingdom, two, which is a taxable supply, in other words, not exempt, three, by a taxable person, someone who is or ought to be registered for VAT, and four, in the course or furtherance of any business carried on by him. Uh, it is not disputed that elements one, two, and four were fulfilled when Mr Rice did work for Mr Partridge at some point before 21st October 1986, but element three was not. Mr Rice was not a taxable person. Um, and then the answer of the commissioners um, is by reference to the timing provision, what was then Regulation 23. Uh, and then just below little h, um, his lordship notes as common ground um, that the work done came within the description provided by that regulation. He notes it's not altogether clear to me why that should be the case, uh, but so it is. Uh, 
Um, and the commissioner's argument in BJ Rice um, is, in fact, their argument in, in, in this case. Um, but over the page, on page 65, um, you can see a paragraph beginning at little b in the margin. Um, the commissioner concludes, applies in this case to be treated as occurring in point of time when Mr. Rice's bill was paid in March 1991. He never issued a tax invoice, it says. And at the time the bill was paid, Mr. Rice was registered. And so the commissioners fulfilled the requirement in section 2 sub 1 that he was a taxable person at the relevant time. Um, if that is the right interpretation of the 1983 Act, it produces an unjust result. Either Mr. Rice will be unable to cover, recover the tax from his customer, he will have to pay it out of his own pocket, or else Mr. Partridge, the customer, will have to pay tax, although it was not chargeable at the time when he both contracted for and received the services of Mr. Rice. Um, and, and, and that's the case here. You know, in, in, in B.J. Rice, if payment had been made at the time the services were contracted for or paid or, or, um, or performed, there would be no tax because the time of supply rule would say the supply is treated as made at a time when Mr. Rice was not a taxable person. Same situation here. When the investment management services were contracted for and in fact performed by Silverfleet, if that had been the time of supply, um, no VAT. Undoubtedly no VAT, because they are within the same VAT group, Silverfleet and Prudential. Um, Suppose a uh, client in Mr Rice's case contracted at a time when Mr Rice was not VAT registered, but you could see that um, payment was not going to be due until the next tax year, next VAT year. And Mr. Rice told him that it was likely that by the time a VAT invoice, uh, an invoice was rendered and payable, his turnover would have increased to such an extent that he probably would have to be registered. Does that make any difference? In other words, is it is it the fact that the taxpayer got the services when Mr. Rice wasn't registered, which is relevant, or that if he'd paid the bill when it was contractually due, it wouldn't have, he wouldn't have had to pay any VAT. That, that is the determining point. Uh, it, as, as we go through the judgment, um, it, it, is, it is the former. It is that the time of supply rules cannot impose where none would have been charged at the time the services were in fact supplied. Okay, thank you. And, and then, so at the bottom of page 65, um, the last paragraph, so I turn to consider whether Regulation 23 fixes the time for deciding the question of whether the supplier is a taxable person within Section 21 of the 1983 Act. So whether the timing provision fixes the time for deciding whether the, 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 the charge for tax. At first sight, one would have thought that it does not. Surely a person who is not registered by that, uh, for that, because his turnover is below the statutory limit, should be free to supply goods or services in the confident belief that neither he nor the recipient will have to bear tax on the supply. Um, why else should there be a leap for small traders, etc.? Um, and then one turns, um, his lordship says, to section 4 of the 1983 Act. Um, he sets out section 4, then he says section 5 contains a number of detailed provisions uh, as to the time of supply of goods or services, ending with subsection 9, which I've already quoted, already quoted in part. Um, then the commissioner's argument is set out um, from little c uh, through to um, well, Mr. Rice's argument at the bottom of that paragraph. Um, perhaps if I might invite your lordships to read that, uh, those two paragraphs, uh, the argument for the commissioners and then the next one.
And then in the next paragraph, beginning a little G, um, His Lordship acknowledges um, obscure provision in section 41. Um, and then he says, but I would regard that as a special provision derogating from section two. Um, and that in all other respects, the existence of a chargeable transaction has to be determined at a time when the supply is actually made. Uh, common sense and justice point to that result. Sections four and five remain to determine the amount to be charged at the time when the charge takes effect. To impose the tax charge on Mr. Rice in respect of a supply, which was not taxable at the time when it was made, seems to me perilously close to retrospective taxation. Um, that may have perhaps be justified, etc. Um, and then at the bottom of page 66... Um, so j just before you go on, as Lord Justice Dawson has explained Mr. Rice's argument, um, he has sought to achieve the result by pointing to the words for the purposes of the charge to tax in section 4.1. Um, we don't have anything equivalent in this case. For the purpose of the charge to tax is um, in section 6, um, which is behind tab 1, oh, I see. Found on page 7, 6 sub 1 at the end. Um, yes, I see. The same way. Yeah. Um, and then at the bottom of page 66, um, its lordship uh, records that Mr. Rice sought help from Hansard. Uh, he says, I do, however, this is the last line on that page, I do, however, find some assistance in another decision of the Valley Island Tribunal with the same chairman, Broadwell Land PLC. There, the tribunal said in plain terms, um, it follows from our analysis so far that the wording of section four and five do not create any charge to VAT. Um, those are the timing provisions, four and five. Uh, their role is to identify the time of the supply, given that there has been one which is in charge under section two sub one. This conclusion is in line with the opening words of section four sub one, which define the role of sections four and five as applying, quote, for determining the time when a supply of goods and services to be treated as taking place for the purpose of the charge to tax. And so that's the same wording as what is now section six. Um, Slight irony there, since, well, uh, the Justice Dawson is relying on what Sir Stephen Oliver had said in this other case, but in this particular case, he'd arrived at the opposite conclusion. Uh, um, but but that, that had been the argument of the commissioners. Um, yeah. What he is saying is that. Um, uh, it supports his conclusion that you cannot, one cannot use a timing provision to impose a tax charge where a tax charge would not yes. have existed at the time of the, the supply. Um, and might, might that be a convenient point? Yes, it would. I've just um, been told by the um, usher that the uh, clock is um, five minutes behind. <laughs> if it is, by a strange coincidence, it's exactly the same as my watch, which both of which say it's exactly one o'clock. Um, however, we will return in one hour. <laughs> Uh, which by my watch is two o'clock, but if uh, in your watch is it's five past one, you know, it'll be five past two. So I made myself sufficiently obscure. Yeah. <laughs>